you know, all growing up, it was like, everything I did, I was like hoping to surf soon. My whole lifestyle is based on like, working really hard for a short season and then going and traveling and just looking for waves. On that journey, there's a lot of other valuable things to see and explore and encounter. Like that's what traveling becomes. Like sometimes it meets your expectations. Sometimes it's like something totally different. I'm thinking maybe breakfast. It's definitely stoked. <laughs> There are people who live and vacation here and don't know that New Jersey has windows of world-class surf. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's all in the pursuit of fun. Really. It's hard to explain to people like why you do it. And then like other people who do it understand. I was lucky to have a dad that took me like surfing. We did all these Central America trips through high school. Like, and like all the older surfers that we knew on the beach or that we hung out in, in the shops or that my dad introduced me to, like I was just a sponge. Like I took it all in. I wanted to be a part of it. And I began to like really make it my identity. You're mining for these tiny little moments of gratification. I mean, like a football play covers more ground. But when you do catch something, it's worth it. Should we go get lunch? Yeah, like Todd and I were in Hasegur. Like the first thing ever we did every morning was go look for crepes somewhere. And we never really found anything that like wowed us. As good as here, you know? Yeah, we got breakfast at two o'clock today because we actually went through. Anyone who wants to learn how to surf, like who are, like seriously wants to learn and not just like take one lesson, you know, I tell them, I'm like, there's this learning curve where you can pretty much guarantee you're gonna suck for two years. I mean, you have to put your time in and there's just not that many rideable days here. Good, it's worth it. And honestly, I feel like so many times you end up driving around for hours, checking one spot, checking another spot. All right, which, way, which place is it better? Is it better here, is it better there? And next thing you know, the tide's switched. Ooh, actually, you know what, let's check it here. You know, you need to be adaptable, you need to be open-minded. Like, there's a lot of factors that make it difficult to learn here. I always kind of gravitated toward like boards with just more foam in them. By riding like the smallest available shape with like the most thinned out performance profile, you're not doing yourself any favors. Like there's an understanding that it's gonna be a lot more work to go and catch waves. I think when I reached like 18, 20, like, and I like finally filled out to like adult weight and size and height and all that, I kind of put the shortboards down. A lot of the successful guys like at the uppermost tier of performance, like the competitive tour that goes around the world, a lot of them, I don't know if they owe their success to their shaper, but there is a strong relationship there. 
everyone's on the same page, down to like a sixteenth of an inch. It's, it's super fine-tuned design, and that's like that's where world titles come into play. There's like that that professional level where they're shaping for like these elite athletes, and then there's like the just the guy in his garage who's trying to make something good enough. philosophical level like Todd and I've been talking lately like you see a shape on a rack or in a room and you're like wow it's amazing I wish I could make something that well I'd love to have that in my size like this color and these fins and it's like do you really want that board I think at the core of it you don't want that board so much as you want the session that that board is designed for the amount of Skilled craftsmanship and care that goes into a single board tailored for one person and their experience in the water. I mean, there's very little else like it. The idea I have is I want to kind of scoop from the depth of the nose, make less swing weight. So yeah, you, you really have to put your time in. And like with shaping and building boards and stuff, it's like I'm at that beginner stage where I'm like just tiptoeing into the water for the first time, like there's all these compound curves and you're trying to blend stuff together and it's like, even if you have a really good plan and you have like all the right tools and you take your time, like it's hard to replicate like a good board. What did I say I wanted to do thickness wise on this? Oh, fuck no, who cares? You know, if something comes out wrong, it's like there's nobody else to blame but yourself, you know. And I think I mentioned before, like, if a board has like some flaw or imperfection or something about it that just makes it ride a little quirky or feel feel different underfoot, if you made it, then there's a good chance you can account for like why it is that way and sort of surf around that. There's nothing worse when your hood flushes and suctions the water into your ears. That's the thing about winter, it's like, it's so cold, mostly miserable. Most things you can say, miserable but it's like that's when you get the waves so you surf until like you freeze to death Surfing serves like a couple purposes, like one escapism. It's you're kind of like 
30 or 40 yards offshore with your back to everything. Two, there's like this meditative aspect. Like, it's just you and your thoughts out there, especially in the wetsuit in the winter. I mean, that's like full on sensory deprivation. I mean, we call it surfing, but like 99% of it is just paddling around. And if you get like an eight second ride or like a 15 second ride, that's like amazing. I mean, there's days that I wouldn't longboard. It's small, but you're still looking at it like, God, there has to be some way to ride that. And now with the foil, like all that becomes accessible. Foiling came from this group of Hawaiian guys doing it maybe like 15 or 20 years ago. They were trying to find like the uppermost limits of speed. And I don't think the surf world was like ready for it. So they had like snowboard boots bolted to like a modified wakeboard setup, surfboard hybrid, and this like four foot air chair on the bottom of that. But it was, I mean, it was a whole generation and a half later that it became commercially available to everyday surfers. It was like last spring, really. I was like floundering out on the foil. I couldn't figure it out. And then eventually caught one and just by luck, like had my feet in the right spot. And the white water died behind me. And there was this new sensation, like one, I'm going like bicycle fast. And two, there's this eerie silence because there's no turbulence anywhere near you. There's this giant expectancy violation and like that light bulb went off again where I was like, oh man, like this is something new. You could change the design and now it becomes like a small wave Swiss army knife. It's like the same vein of like what I've been pursuing my whole life. But this, I can do this in like tiny surf and, and go really fast. And uh, the whole journey since has just been about like chasing that initial feeling of that glide. There's only three eggs, but you could split them. Should be enough, but no, maybe not. Three. We have food at home. Oh. I'll take a chip, boys. You got them, yeah. You got a preference, Kyle? Thanks, a chocolate taco. Oh, throwback. Alright, do we check it or do we just go get breakfast? <laughs>